All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon for NEHA's webinar series on government affairs updates. And I will go ahead and you know, waste no time and go straight to introducing our uh, Director of Government Affairs, Doug Farquhar, and uh, let him have the floor. Uh, thank you, Michael. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everyone this afternoon. I'm gonna share my screen and uh, give me a, just a minute here to bring it up. And there it goes. Um, Thank you again. I want to go over a few things this afternoon uh, with NEHA Government Affairs. Number one, I want to kind of talk about what is uh, the state of government affairs and government uh, across the country. And uh, number two, I want to talk about what NEHA is doing in response to the nature of uh, government affairs uh, in this country right now, and then go over some of the bills that have been enacted. Uh, in this past year to give everyone a good sense about what's going on uh, policy-wise regarding environmental health. Uh, first of all, I'd like to kind of highlight the fact about the difficulty of policymaking. Um, unlike when you're in the agency and you are just dealing with a series of scientifically based and uh, very narrow issues with uh, legislative policy and with policymaking in general, it's very complicated. It's uh, the processes and the procedures are complex. Um, yes, you can understand them. Yes, you can gauge them, but it's very difficult to uh, identify what are gonna trigger the policymakers in the various states and in Congress and at the local uh, level and at the boards of health. What is gonna make them say, we wanna invest in environmental health? So it's good if you take a look at where, uh, what is the vantage point of the policymaker? For Congress, it is a real focus on uh, national issues. It's a real focus on trying to promote your individual party. There's a real focus on appropriations, how much funding you want to give to each one of the federal agencies. Um, and uh, really taking, uh, when it comes to the policy side, it's much more difficult. Uh, we aren't seeing much uh, as much policy coming out of the federal government as we do the states and locals. Um, for the locals, uh, or I mean for the states, uh, they have a different point of view. They're looking at their constituents. Party is much less important at the state legislative level. Um, you are going to be focusing on different issues that are gonna be most important to your constituency, to the people you actually represent. So it's much more likely that you'd be focusing on different policy uh, operations and different ways uh, to promote policies within your state and directing the state agencies to do things. Much less so appropriations. They have much less money to work with. Um, whereas the federal government almost has an unlimited source, every state, has a budget which they have to meet and they cannot exceed. So therefore they're all limited by the taxing authorities uh, within their state, which keeps themselves always um, uh, much more limited on what they're going to be able to propose and engage in and uh, be, make it much more difficult to um, promote and allow agencies to do what they need to do uh, within the state for locals. Again, it's much more, uh, much even more narrow than what you see at the state level. It's a very local uh, operation. Your constituency is very narrow. Uh, and even trying to do some basic things like mask mandates and uh, authorities to respond to uh, certain things within the public health community, you're going to get much more pushback and you're going to get immediate pushback. Um, you don't have the buffer of being 2,000 miles away in Washington. This is where the public can come right to the board meeting. They can face you directly. And in some situations, they can actually come to your home and uh, confront you that way. So therefore, um, decisions made at the local level are very real and very pertinent to the public they Im impact. So you got to remember that, that when you make a change or a policy or you promote a policy 
at the local level that the policymakers that are making that decision have to answer to their constituents uh, immediately. Um, now, how does politics look out there? Where, if you look nationally, you can definitely see that uh, politics are, we are very much a purple country, that, uh, that we have quite a bit of uh, red space out there where we don't have large populations and we have a very narrow line of blue, blue areas, which where the majority of the population lives. So um, when you start dealing with things per square mile, you're gonna see uh, the more, more, the higher density population, the more likely you're gonna have Democrats or more liberal uh, politicians, less densely populated, more, less likely to be Democrat, more likely to be Republican and uh, uh, operate from a conservative point of view. Right now, the country is very much evenly divided. 33% of the US identifies itself as Democrat, 29% identifies itself as Republican, 34 identify themselves as independents. So actually independents are the largest majority out there. And as been noted, uh, they probably have the most influence about which direction an election shall go if you can convince them to vote uh, in your favor. State governments are around 52% controlled by Republicans, 47% uh, are controlled by Democrats. And regarding uh, redistricting and the Electoral College, Republicans have a strong advantage, and that has been seen very much so in the last several presidential elections, where not since um, uh, 1988 have a Republican received the popular vote, with the exception of the 2004 election with George W. Bush. Um, really, you know, all the recent elections. Uh, Democrats have won the majority, but the Republicans have been able to take office um, simply because of uh, the Electoral College or redistricting advantages. When you start looking that down to the state legislatures, um, that gives us around 52% Republican, 47% controlled by Democrat. We also have 107 independent uh, people out there who haven't identified either party. Um, that gives us 62% of the chambers in the legislatures are controlled by Republican versus 38% controlled by Democrats. Um, in uh, overall state control, you're going to have to remember that vast majority of state legislatures are Republican controlled, a vast majority are conservative. The nature of the business is that they're going to be conservative. You uh, win elections not by high, having high taxes or doing radical activities. You win elect elections by not rocking the boat. You win elections by taking moderate steps. It, um, the nature of a political process is going to encourage politicians to be more conservative than liberal. Um, they're going to be less likely to want to raise taxes, they're going to be much less likely to want to make dramatic changes in the structure of government because the way government has been built up has been a consensus process over the past several hundred years. So um, just inherent, uh, inherently uh, politicians, especially at the state and local level, are going to be conservative. 117th Congress, the Congress that is in session right now, uh, it is controlled by Democrats. 223 Democrats in the House versus 213 Republicans. We have six non-voting members and several vacancies right now in the Senate. It is controlled by Democrats, 48 Democrats and two independents that are voting with the Democrats. Uh, in this, uh, for the Republicans, we have 50 Republican senators. So it's evenly divided. The tiebreaker is Vice President Kamala Harris. And since she will vote with the Democrats, the Democrats have a majority, but the majority is as tight as you almost can possibly get. Um, there's a real strong likelihood that in the next Congress, the 118th, that we will see Republican majorities in both the House and the Senate. Um, there, uh, 
it's been notorious and traditionally that the president's party loses seats in both houses uh, on the midterms, uh, especially in the first midterms. And uh, with such tight control going on right now, and with redistricting being controlled primarily by Republicans in many states, uh, there's a real likelihood that the Republicans will take control of the 118th. Puts pressure on the Biden administration, on Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer right now to get things enacted. Because if it doesn't get enacted in the, 20, in the 117th Congress, their, their ability to get things done regarding climate change, regarding infrastructure, regarding tax policy is going to become much more challenging to the point of being impossible. So um, uh, the Biden administration, um, the speaker, the president of the Senate, they're all very well aware of this. And they are acting in such to make sure that the policies that they seek to get done are going to be enacted in the next year. Environmental health in the Biden administration. Right now, we have uh, uh, most of the administration has been appointed uh, for climate change. They actually created a special envoy and a climate czar. Uh, special envoy uh, internationally is John Kerry, our former Secretary of State. Uh, the former EPA administrator for Obama is our climate czar. So the Biden administration has made a strong push and a strong effort towards addressing climate change. The EPA administrator is Michael Regan, and he is a former, not only EPA uh, staff person, but a, a state administrator coming from the state of North Carolina. So he has both federal and state experience. The Council on Environmental Quality, Brenda Mallory, she has extensive experience with climate change, and she is probably going to emphasize that effort with the president, Department of Energy, Jennifer Granholm, uh, the um, Department of Interior with uh, Representative Deb Haaland. She has uh, uh, been a very um, inventive, uh, innovative choice and something that is going to really put the tribal issue to the forefront. Uh, HUD secretary is former Cleveland representative Marcia Fudge. Uh, so there's a really good chance that issues such as healthy homes and lead control, which has always been one of her issues, will get a higher uh, presence within the HUD administration, within the Biden administration at HUD. CDC director, uh, as Dr. Uh, Rochelle Walensky, um, she is a very competent uh, 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 physician and with quite a bit of background, but she has absolutely no background in environmental health which has been a um, hindrance to us. But on the other hand, she is also shown to be very, very open to learning, to understanding more about why environmental health is so important to, for public health. Uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland and HHS Secretary Xavier Becerra, um, that rounds out the environmental health issues within the administration. The bottom line is we aren't seeing a huge uh, environmental health focus in the administration, but they aren't adverse either. So we must take that into account. Um, what is NEHA doing on government affairs? Well, right now we have 11 active policy statements that have been adopted by the board. These policy statements govern what government affairs will do. Uh, if an issue comes forward that people want us to sign on to or support or move forward, the first thing we have to do in government affairs is identify whether we have a policy on that issue or not. So if an issue such as having to do with Medicaid reimbursement comes forward, it's not something that NEHA is going to sign on to because the, because the board has not signed a policy on it. If it comes forward on climate change, we will sign on to it because the board has adopted a policy on that. We will have seven proposed policies going to the board in uh, for adoption in November. Um, and at that point, if they adopt all of them, it'll greatly expand the government affairs portfolio. Regarding position statements, these are declarations that come from either the board or the president. Um, oftentimes these are um, uh, resolutions talking about, we support um, National Preparedness Month, which is September, 2021. 
Food Safety Month prepared uh, September 2021. Those are the things on, that we actually do on our position statements, and we have nine active ones right now. In 2020, we sent 20 sign-ons to Congress saying these are issues that NEHA supports. These are issues that the board has adopted or has agreed to that is important to the environmental health community and uh, warrants the NEHA sign-on. Uh, blog posts, we've done 10 talking about what's going on in Congress, mostly regarding appropriations, uh, identifying what has been key to appropriations in the 117th Congress, and also uh, identifying uh, the infrastructure bills. What in the infrastructure bills will affect environmental health? Um, in the one that has passed in the past month, that one has quite a bit to deal with water and water infrastructure and lead replacement for lead, uh, lead pipes in, uh, in the community. So there are several activities going on regarding the one that has currently been passed. The one that they're still negotiating, less so. On environmental health, even though it does have a strong public health training component, which is something that would have an uh, impact on the environmental health community. Um, NEHA is actively supporting five bills before Congress, including the uh, social determinants uh, bill, um, social determinants of health bill, uh, the Environmental Health Workforce Act, uh, the Public Health Workforce Loan Forgiveness Act, which uh, was introduced by Jason Crow. Um, Jason Crow's office has confirmed that that would include environmental health. So if people have uh, student loan debt from environmental health, they could have that written off if this, pass, if this bill passes. Uh, the Public Health Infrastructure Saves Lives Act we have signed on to, and a recent act that has come out of, uh, of Representative Dan Kildee's office, the Test Your Well Water Act. NEHA has signed on to that and has agreed to support that effort. We've also sent one key letter to the administration from NEHA itself. This has to do with public health training. Uh, there is a uh, uh, several billion dollars going towards uh, CDC to start um, uh, help the training and the retention of the public health workforce. Uh, we have sent a letter and have reached out to several people in the administration to say, do not forget that environmental health is part of the public health workforce. And therefore, we really would like to see that uh, environmental health is funded and we see environmental health training and environmental health retention funded under this act. We've received some uh, positive responses, but nothing guaranteed. Regarding state legislatures in the 2021 session, uh, NEHA, based on its policies, was able to send uh, letters um, as testimony to uh, legislatures in 33 states. Um, I'm sorry, in 19 different states for 33 different bills mostly on cottage foods. Um, what we did with that was simply sent our cottage food policy, had it read into the meeting minutes for the committee minutes for the bill. And therefore, um, when a legislator gets their, uh, their bill packet and they can see all the uh, letters in support or against or neutral on a specific bill, they're going to see NEHA's policy statement on cottage foods and we give them some insight of why we have our concerns regarding cottage foods. We also sent similar ones uh, regarding uh, public health workforce, environmental health workforce, environmental health credentialing. We had some challenges on that issue in West Virginia, which we responded to and provided our comments and thoughts on that. And then also regarding South Carolina's effort to, uh, uh, to uh, divide public health and environmental programs. Right now, they're one of the last states to include public health and environment under one agency. Uh, and they're in the process of looking at dividing that. Uh, NEHA sent their opinion about some of the concerns that you may want to consider if you're going to separate an agency along those lines. We've also uh, had uh, 19 visits by the government affairs staff to congressional offices on various bills and appropriations. And we also have had a Hill Day last April on April 22nd, where um, 21 NEHA members visited 44 
congressional offices to talk mainly about uh, the CDC appropriation for environmental health, but other environmental health concerns that are important to the environmental health community and the Nihon constituency. Okay, what's going on with environmental health in the uh, states? Well, we saw several bills introduced regarding public health and public health boards and the authority that public health has to address issues. And this is absolutely in response to COVID-19. When, when COVID-19 hit, it was really up to many of the state and local public health boards to move forward. Uh, the prior administration made a conscious effort not to make strong statements regarding, uh, regarding COVID-19 and uh, ways to um, mitigate the spread of the disease. This administration is taking a different point of view, but in the meantime, that, it put a lot, that placed a lot of pressure on uh, local boards of health to um, adopt mass mandates and to implement that uh, against um, schools, against businesses, against the public in general. Um, that led to many county commissioners and the public itself to push back and reject some of those uh, requests for uh, mass mandates and for other mitigation efforts to limit the spread of COVID-19. Um, in response, several bill, several states have uh, uh, came forward and limited the authority of their public health boards. And in fact, we saw over 50 bills uh, out there trying to reassert or assert legislative authority over the governor and over uh, the state public health authority to implement these activities. Um, these laws uh, are really buried among the states and among the locals as to the extent that a public health board may have regarding, uh, regarding expanding uh, COVID mandates um, and the governor's authority to implement these activities. Um, in Delaware, for example, the governor has authority for a month and then the legislature has the opportunity to reassess that authority. Other states, the governor had complete authority in other jurisdictions, the public health board had complete authority to move forward with these uh, mitigation factors. Um, that led to quite a bit of pushback. So in turn, the legislature and many county commissioners came forward and limited the public health authority. One of the most um, extensive ones we saw was in Ohio. It uh, now has strong legislative oversight regarding uh, uh, the governor's public health authority to the point that even if you have a, um, uh, a person who is um, uh, cooking, is a chef working in a restaurant that has a contagious disease, the governor does not have the ability to take that person out, to uh, quarantine that person. In fact, that person may act and may continue working and spreading disease um, until the legislature takes action, which may not occur uh, for several months. So this is a very sharp change to what can be done in Ohio. In other states like Michigan, uh, we saw uh, the governor had quite a bit of authority um, and they have still retained quite a bit of authority to address public health, but that authority also is the same authority that allowed it to change the uh, water from the uh, Detroit water system in Flint to the Flint water system, which led to the Flint uh, lead crisis. So uh, there are some mixed reasons why a legislature or a um, county commissioner board will wanna have oversight regarding a public health board. Um, regarding licensing, uh, several bills came forward, uh, mostly for um, uh, the ones that got enacted in Idaho and Maine. They sought to improve the occupational professional licensing laws that are out there. So these are good government laws that were enacted. Uh, Wyoming, uh, they passed a law this year that now requires public health officers to have a degree in medicine 
or have an advanced degree as a practicing nurse or a physician assistant. Um, West Virginia, we had quite a bit of uh, concerns in West Virginia this year because they sought to sunset the Board of Sanitarians and sought to repeal credentialing requirements in that state. Both those bills were uh, did not uh, advance. Uh, NEHA did have comments on both those bills and did provide testimony on that. Uh, but we did see some activity regarding environmental health licensing in the state of West Virginia that would have been adverse to the environmental health workforce. Drinking water. Drinking water is probably the foremost issue that uh, we see in environmental health in, um, in the states. Uh, we saw 162 bills this year introduced on drinking water and it really covered the gambit. Um, several, several bills I wanted to highlight here that I found interesting uh, um, that we saw introduced in the states. New York uh, Senate Bill 5588 and Assembly Bill 3979 establishes a state drinking water bill of rights to, for the state of New York. West Virginia, they had several bills that were dealing with the Clean Drinking Water Act of 2020, which none of which passed. Uh, California, they had a strong bill this year, AB 1195, which um, provides safe drinking water to vulnerable communities. It also has a strong uh, element in there to encourage local drinking water boards to consolidate. So you don't have small uh, boards that don't have the resources to provide safe drinking water to their community. There are several communities in, uh, in California that have a very um, limited uh, uh, water uh, board that has very limited access to water and has trouble providing water to their community. This is an effort to encourage these boards to consolidate, to become big enough to provide a substantial amount, uh, to become large enough to provide water to the community that is safe and meets EPA standards. Um, Kentucky, they are looking at a public water and wastewater system infrastructure task force to make sure there's uh, enough adequate water and wastewater activities occurring in the state. Um, that is another state which has several small water uh, districts and they are having trouble meeting EPA standards. And so one of their efforts that uh, the legislature is encouraging and also being encouraged by the federal EPA is for consolidation. So these small districts work to consolidate so they actually are able to meet the needs of uh, water for their, for their districts. Um, Florida, I found Senate Bill 1706 very interesting. It provides the ability for private individuals to request the Department of Health to come in and test their water. And this would be both in private wells and public and their public utility. This bill did not pass, but it was a very interesting effort by the legislature to uh, provide the community and provide private citizens the ability to get their water tested um, to make sure that it, it has met, um, met uh, current state and federal requirements. Uh, a bill that did pass is California Senate Bill 200. It has the State Water Resources Control Board to administer provisions regarding the regulation of drinking water to protect public health. This expands their authority and puts more pressure on the local water districts to make sure that they are providing adequate and safe water to their constituents. Um, regarding PFAS, we saw 15 bills out there re related to PFAS in drinking water. In total, across the board, there was 213 bills regarding PFAS in general, but uh, only 15 came forward on drinking water. The only ones that um, were uh, that, that are note, I'm really going to have to say, because most of them did not pass. But uh, Florida did have a bill out there that did, did um, uh, emphasize that airports, if uh, uh, any PFAS chemicals are being found that are, can be attributed to the airports, they would not be liable for contamination. New Hampshire also had uh, House Bills 2271, which set 
standards for PFAS in drinking water and groundwater. Right now, EPA does not have standards in place. They have recommendations, they have health-based uh, recommendations, but nothing in the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is going to require a local water district to um, change their uh, efforts to eliminate uh, PFAS. Uh, New Hampshire has moved forward on that and they have set forward standards. Hawaii, a bill has a bill uh, that passed, Senate Bill 348. Um, this, uh, this is something that is going to allow bottled, uh, bottled water to be transported. It was something that uh, a glitch which in, within their law, which did not allow bottled water to be transported uh, uh, through, um, through equipment and lines that only water is passed. This uh, kind of provided a little bit of uh, challenges for the bottled water community. So uh, the state of Hawaii changed that. In New Mexico, uh, House Bill 92 creates the Safe Drinking Water Testing Fund. Uh, it allows uh, to ensure public utilities are able to test the water to meet EPA standards. And so that was a pretty forth, um, uh, pretty forthright bill that was passed in New Mexico. Food safety. Um, every year we see an enormous amount of uh, bills regarding food safety, and this year was no exception. Um, some of the, the bills that we've seen on food safety this year are probably the most notorious ones are the ones that deal with um, food freedom. Now, I'm encouraged that uh, several um, people out there are now calling all food freedom laws, which means cottage food, microenterprise kitchens, uh, small uh, exemptions, they're all calling everything now food freedom, which is probably uh, makes things a little bit easier, but it does get us back to the point that several states are enacting laws that uh, pull back on uh, government regulatory oversight of food safety. And in fact, there are laws in every state with the exception of New Jersey, um, and uh, every state addresses it in a slightly different manner. At one point, I was able to categorize these bills as being dealing with small, um, small uh, uh, kitchens that they could not sell on the internet, that they can only sell directly to consumers, and that they had to be labeled. Um, we do not see that any longer. We are seeing changes to it, and we're seeing these laws expanded. We are now seeing food freedom laws in uh, the states of Wyoming, North Dakota, Maine, Utah, and New Mexico. These laws are uh, even more expansive than cottage food laws. These food freedom laws uh, uh, severely limit, in fact, prohibit the state to have any regulatory oversight. Um, it provides for certain things like in Wyoming, certain things can be sold without labels. There's no way that the consumer will know that it was produced in a non-regulated setting and that the state has no oversight of it. Uh, also in the state of Wyoming, you can purchase chicken and poultry products and actually several meat products without any uh, oversight by the, uh, by the state government. And all this falls within the parameters of USDA's um, uh, uh, requirements where they allow for certain small operations to operate without a USDA um, uh, license. And the state has, um, has uh, capitalized on that and now allow for several meats to be sold without any oversight. North Dakota, they adopted a very expansive uh, food freedom law. The State Department of Health came in, they negotiated, they tried to limit things to make sure that the most egregious activities did not occur. Um, they were, there was pushback from the legislature. And so now uh, many activities can occur that, uh, that uh, are potentially uh, can cause foodborne outbreaks. So it's something that could be very concerning. In Maine, uh, the state does not have uh, food freedom laws, but it allows for local and local governments to have that. And so if a local government performs something like allows people to purchase 
shellfish or uh, seafood directly from uh, the uh, uh, fishermen. They can sell it directly in a, uh, a market. They can sell it directly in a restaurant and uh, not have any state. The state cannot overfile on that. So there's a real great opportunity for uh, outbreaks in the state of Maine because of this. Um, but it's a, a very proactive effort um, uh, and the state of Maine considers that food, they call it food sovereignty instead of food freedom. Utah and New Mexico were the two states that expanded this year and created new food safety laws, I'm sorry, food freedom laws. Uh, Wyoming uh, expanded theirs, but they had it, they were the first to adopt food freedom back in 2015. Utah and New Mexico, these new laws um, are very proactive and they are going to dramatically limit what uh, uh, the state and local governments can do to provide food safety oversight. The New Mexico law was in direct uh, response to a law that the city of Albuquerque put forth that uh, provided uh, some strong uh, licensing and certification requirements and really uh, made sure that food sold in the city of Albuquerque uh, followed suit food safety requirements. Well, the state has um, overfiled on that um, and said that the that a local community cannot do that, that the state uh, will preempt any sort of activity along those things. There were several other uh, food safety, cottage food laws um, that were introduced, 133, and of those 17 were enacted. Um, uh, the ones that are most notable were enactments in California where they have expanded their micro enterprise kitchen law um, to, uh, and uh, that is now uh, more, uh, they have more activities regarding that uh, micro enterprise law in Arkansas. They expanded uh, their uh, cottage food laws to a lot more purchasing uh, of those laws of the of the uh, product. Um, Oklahoma, they now allow for the Homemade Food Act under House Bill uh, 1032. And as we talked about in Utah, they also allow micro enterprise kitchens to uh, occur in that state. Um, regarding meat, we saw 42 bills introduced and 11 enacted. None of those bills had to do with the labeling of cell-based meat. Now that is a new um, technology that's come out where it's allowed uh, that it is uh, non-traditional uh, meat production. Rather than slaughtering an animal, you grow the product in a, in a laboratory. Um, in uh, the states of Texas, uh, New York, Wisconsin, South Dakota, Kansas, they all had bills regarding uh, the labeling of cell-based meat that you had to provide some sort of labeling of this. Uh, these bills did not uh, pass, but they did have a, um, uh, they, they did kind of emphasize the interest and the concern among the uh, meat producers uh, and the cattle industry and other uh, meat producing industries about this new technology that's coming down that is gonna have a very dramatic impact on their industry. Um, Colorado Senate Bill 21-79. This is a very interesting bill I found because it's basically a food freedom or cottage food law specifically for uh, uh, meat producers. It basically exempts all licensure of, for, of sale of meat by small producers. Um, South Carolina and Indiana also had similar bills, but they did not pass. Uh, the reason I found it interesting in Colorado is it was uh, passed by a democratically controlled legislature and signed by a Democratic governor. Um, the governor uh, had a strong belief in saying that um, small producers need the ability to operate and uh, the state should not prohibit uh, the ability for these small producers to sell 
to you know, slaughter meat and sell it at farmer's market without any oversight. Um, uh, whether they, we will see in, any more outbreaks in this state um, regarding that uh, or not, we don't know, but uh, it was very far reaching um, because it deals with meat. I put it under my meat category instead of cottage foods, but uh, it is basically a cottage foods law. Regarding FSMA, uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which had quite a bit of activity in past legislatures, saw very little this year. In fact, we only saw three, three bills introduced on FSMA and none of them were passed. But in Montana, West Virginia, and Hawaii, they all had bills that had mentioned and identified FSMA. In Hawaii, it had to do with the importation of food, which is a very critical issue for them because so much of their food is either, well, almost all their food is either imported from the mainland US or from overseas. And so they were very concerned about FSMA importation policies. West Virginia, they urged FDA not to implement the FSMA rules as written because they were putting a strain on the uh, farmers and uh, their, their production methods. Um, uh, it's a, uh, it was a resolution, it did not pass, it did have no, no effective law, but it did identify uh, some of the concerns that I've heard from legislatures in the past about the impact that FISMA would have on, uh, on uh, the uh, farmers. Um, and Montana, they were looking at a joint resolution as well that was gonna look at the study of food regulations. What is the impact? Why do we have food regulations? Um, to me, not only was that a FSMA law, but that was also a uh, cottage food law, which is kind of warrants and kind of highlights the fact that legislatures and specifically the legislature in Montana is having questions if we should have any food regulation whatsoever. And this is something that comes up quite often, which is we are passing these food freedom laws, we are passing these food uh, uh, cottage food laws, and we aren't seeing any foodborne outbreaks. Why do we have the laws in the first place? This could lead to an extreme challenge for our environmental health community. Um, and it's something that NEHA is keeping uh, very well aware of. Regarding raw milk, 50 were introduced, three were passed. Uh, food delivery. This is a new issue that is coming into play. We saw 10 bills in uh, New Hampshire, uh, New York, California, Arkansas, Missouri, Texas, West Virginia, Colorado, and New Jersey that deal with food delivery. They were enacted in Colorado, New Hampshire, New Jersey, and Texas. What they're looking at is what is the liability of the driver when they deliver the food? Can they be accused or can they be liable for food safety issues? What is the liability of the producer, the restaurant that produces this? When they give it to the driver, can they be liable for any uh, adulteration that the driver may do between the restaurant and the consumer? So these are all bills that have come forward to, uh, to um, uh, address those concerns that are regarded food delivery. Uh, on retail food, we saw about 152 introduced, uh, about 26 um, adopted. Um, uh, one I would highlight here is that is uh, New York uh, Assembly Bill 1262 or 7878. Um, it requires a USDA approval for all online fresh foods. So if you are gonna purchase foods over the internet, you have to have USDA approval in your, if it's going to be sold uh, in the state of New York. Restaurants, uh, 63 were introduced, seven were enacted. Uh, Massachusetts House Bill 411 uh, allows for fresh produce in restaurants, and this is part of their farm to restaurant program. Connecticut, uh, New Jersey, they both pass laws that allow SNAP, that people can use their SNAP benefits in restaurants. In New Jersey, they also adopted uh, Assembly Bill 3697, which addresses the farm to restaurant program. Uh, food deserts. Um, the reason I, I'm finding this really interesting is because when we first began looking at food deserts out there, 
No state had even addressed it. Uh, it was something that was a academic concept. It was something that uh, legislatures did not deal with at all. In the past few years, in the past, in the 2018 legislative sessions and the 2020 legislative sessions, we're starting to see that bill, uh, that term emerge. Nine bills were introduced addressing steer, uh, food deserts. Three were enacted. Um, Maryland enacted Senate Bill 723. Maine enacted Legislative Bill uh, 691. Other bills emerged in Arizona, New Jersey, New York, West Virginia, Maine, Pennsylvania, and Mississippi, all dealing with food deserts. This is showing that this concept is catching on. and People are gaining concern regarding uh, food deserts. So my final slide here is uh, just to get back to uh, policymaking in general. What are the challenges you deal with policymaking? Why do policymakers adopt these certain things? Or as one CDC uh, environmental health director asked me, what is wrong with these people? There's nothing wrong with state policymakers. There's nothing wrong with local policymakers. They are responding to their constituents' concerns. Um, and it takes a long time and a, a long effort to get policy change, to get it adopted. But by doing so, it incorporates all the interests, all the stakeholders. Everybody has the opportunity to come in and make their comments, their thoughts be known. So um, this is what I often come forward with. And when I tell people, what needs to be done with policymaking? There's five stages. You got denial. When you first introduce it, people are going to reject it. Um, we don't need this problem. We don't need this. There is not a problem out there. I don't know why we are talking about these issues. Anger. When it gets high, when it gets more elevated, uh, CDC, EPA, what's the federal government? Why are they pushing this? Why do we have these problems emerging? What's going on with food delivery? Why do we have these new types of tattooing going on? Why do we have these new types of body art occurring? Um, we often get uh, pushback from the legislature bargaining. What do we need to do? How do we get the, the make this problem go away? How do we get the funding from the federal government and not do the program? You know, how, what's the, uh, what's, what are the different stakeholders that we have to bring forward? Depression, when they inevitably realize they're going to have to adopt the policy, and finally, acceptance. They will accept it. So if you are willing to have the patience, the policy will get adopted. If you go before a legislature once, you probably won't have, you probably won't have much luck. It is the issues and the policies that come before state policymakers year after year after year that gain traction, that get the attention, that it ultimately gets adopted. I have seen amazing things get adopted by the most conservative legislatures out there. Food deserts is a very good example. These are issues that were dramatically rejected by most uh, legislators that I dealt with. In fact, the comment was, um, you know, there are no, uh, there's no fresh food within a two mile radius of this, in this one community, I don't have a grocery store within 10 miles of my house. Why do you think this is a problem? Now we're seeing those very same legislators saying, yeah, food deserts are a problem. We need to figure out a way to get fresh food to our constituents. And the fact that we don't have grocery stores to reach these rural communities is a problem. So I do see things happen Things do happen in the good, in the long run, but it takes an enormous effort. Final slide, this is my name. I direct government affairs for NEHA. We have an ambitious agenda in the coming years and for the 2022 legislative cycle. I look forward to hearing from you and I'll be welcome to take any questions that, may, that we may have. So Michael, are there any questions? Um, well, we've had some comments, um, and actually, we just came in with a question. First, I want to apologize to everyone for the audio. Um, we will improve that before the next one. Um, I, I thought we had fixed it before the webinar started, but, but clearly, we need to 
you need to improve on that. Um, so the question from Steve uh, Conkle. Doug, what do you think of a selected overview of climate and health in the state of Alaska, progress in climate and health in a bellwether state, the last great frontier? Energy policy is a key area affecting climate and carbon footprints. Certainly the connection between federal policy, evolving dynamic, local to global, and the options for facing the 32nd Alaska State Legislature. It could be a great collaboration and educational for environment, environmental health professionals. It could move us towards acceptance. Good quotes, well done on the five stages. Um, with, uh, with Alaska, and Alaska actually is one of my favorite states to work with um, because uh, climate change affects that state much more real than it does in the lower 48. That being said, everybody's starting to deal with this. Everybody's starting to face this. Um, we are seeing uh, 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 disasters occur. You know, hurricanes happen annually now. They used to be a very rare occurrence. Now they happen all the time. Um, floods are happening all the time. Wildfires are happening all the time. We are, we are really getting to the point where we cannot ignore climate change any longer. And that's really coming, you know, very, becoming very true throughout federal government and throughout the state governments. Question is, what do you do about it? You know, how do you address it? You have uh, greenhouse gas emission bills that were adopted in California. You have activities regarding um, uh, resolutions that we saw in several Northeastern states saying we should adopt the Paris Climate Accords. Uh, we see things out there, but like what are the actual on the ground things that we can do that are gonna make an immediate difference? That's something that's very tough to address in, uh, in any state because this is such a huge problem. Um, we are gonna be seeing enormous amount of funding coming out of the uh, federal government and coming out of the CDC. It's gonna be interesting who adopts it, who accepts that money and what they're gonna do with it. Uh, and I think it's gonna really provide us a very interesting um, legal epidemiology effort where we're gonna be taking a look and seeing what, what's working out there. If Alaska takes their money and comes up with a policy that works, we may be able to adopt it uh, nationwide. So, Michael, any other questions? Uh, we do have some comments, uh, well, actually from Alan Wyman. Uh, if policymakers are only responding to their cons constituents' concerns, why are they trying to stop their constituents from voting? And then also he comments, many of these laws or proposals seem to be purely based on partisan lines. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting because, yes, there are constituents out there that may oppose certain policies, um, but they are going to respond to the constituents that, um, that got them there. And this is one of the old sayings within politics is you got to dance with the uh, folks that brung you. Well, who got you there? Who got you elected? And there's a lot of cynicism with this. Um, from us in the environmental health community, we are kind of limited. You know, the th you need one of three things to get um, to get a policymaker's attention. You either got to have uh, votes, you got to have money, or you got to have information. And the environmental health community will never have enough money to compete with fossil fuels. We'll never have enough votes that are going to compete with like unions or uh, different par par party issues. But we have information, and we need to use that information, and we need to get that information to the policymakers. Now, that effort will probably land on uh, uh, deaf ears in many places, but I, I'm always been encouraged by how you are able, how I've been able to communicate with every policymaker, no matter what the issue is. And I'll be glad to have a long talk with anyone about how we were able, how we talked to the Alabama um, uh, uh, chair of health committee in the Senate and how he came around to adopting uh, cannabis for the state, which is something that was absolutely something they were not going to be, was adverse to everything they believed in. 
They changed their mind because the facts came forward. Well, that's all of our questions and comments. Well, Michael, with that, I am gonna say thank you to everyone. Thank you for listening. Um, this has been recorded. So if people would like to come back later and listen to it, I'll be glad to, it, it, it will be online very shortly. And again, you have questions, you have comments, you have concerns. I will be glad to uh, respond to you. So with that, Michael, thank you. Thanks everyone.